Fragmentation. So the next topic. Um, a lot of this is going to pertain to something I'm sure you've all heard about, and that's the theory of island biogeography. Um, we'll just review this real quick for you. Uh, there are three key facets. Um, first, species richness. And if you remember, species richness is the number of species. So if your bird species richness is 15, there are 15 species of birds. You usually don't lump birds, mammals, and reptiles, and insects to, together, but you look at it by each group. Anyway, it, 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 island size is, uh, determines the balance between colonization uh, and extinction. Um, the larger the island is, the, the more species there are going to be. Um, so the number of species is correlated with island size, and it's also correlated to the distance from the mainland. So here we're, we're actually talking about islands, which we're not really going to be talking about tonight. Um, but you can see this island is closer to the mainland. It's a little lar larger than two. Maybe it's the same size. I don't know. I didn't measure it. Uh, but it's going to have more species because it's closer. Here's a real world example. This Wallace's line is interesting in that um, Australian species move about this far through the island uh, and then Asian uh, down the Malaysian uh, peninsula move about this far. Uh, and so you have primarily Asian species here and Australian uh, species here. Now island size is also going to make a big difference. This island is going to have more species on it than this island unless it's too far away. Uh, so these, all these, these two factors are going to really interrelate and determine how many species are in the area. Uh, and then of course there's a lot of things that go on. What's the habitat quality? What's the natural history of the species? What about predators? What about diseases? All of these things uh, we're going to talk about uh, that are going to play some kind of effect. But we're really going to be talking about patches instead of islands. Um, and that's because we're going to be in, a, in a tr uh, South Africa where we're dealing with terrestrial patches. Uh, so here's three aerial photographs of patches of forest separated. This one is separated by a sea of agriculture. Um, this is patches of forest separated by a sea of housing. Uh, and this is patches of forest separated by a sea of mining activity. So you would expect this patch to have more animals in it than this smaller one. Uh, this one more than this one uh, and so on. And you also have to consider, and we'll be discussing this more a bit later, what this habitat in between these patches is. Obviously with an island you have ocean and mammals don't do well in the ocean unless they're uh, dolphins or whales. Um, so, but in these areas this matrix or the the type of habitat in between the patches that you're most interested in could be um, very hospitable to the mammal species or it could be very hostile. So um, those are considerations that, that we'll discuss a little bit more. Another thing you should realize too is landscape fragmentation, landscape changes is not random. Uh, it may look so uh, in something like this, but it's actually pretty predictable. Uh, most of the landscape change, the, the greatest amount of fragmentation typically occurs in flatter areas, uh, lower elevations, uh, and areas of more productive soil. So common sense if you think about it. Um, and as I was saying, it's important not to, only to consider the health of the species within the island, but also the matrix around. So that matrix is the land surrounding it, uh, fragments, um, and therefore the fauna, or the animals are strongly influenced by the physical and biological processes over that wider landscape. For example, in Nicaragua, <laughs> I can't ever say that, Nicaragua, for example, riparian forests, secondary forests, forest fallows, live fences, pastures, dispersed trees, each support diverse assemblages of birds, bats, dung beetles, butterflies. So this whole landscape of different habitat, being the tropical forest or riparian forest, 
uh, is surrounded by something that really live fences, forest fallows, pastures is not negative to these different species. Um, and it, it's important to recognize the whole landscape and not just center on the different patch or patch size. So here are comparisons of individual fragments. These obviously are very large and then here you've got a lot of small ones. These ones that are small uh, and close together may be just as positive for species distribution as these. Uh, as long as this matrix in between them is not a hostile environment. So you have to consider uh, the matrix as well. And that's called landscape ecology. Uh, I wish somebody would define landscape. It's usually a large area, and I can't really find a better description than that. Um, but most hab habitat fragmentation studies just look at the, the health of the species in the individual fragments, and, and they don't look at the whole landscapes. Um, now, in South Africa, where we are, many of our patches that we're going to be looking at are fenced. Uh, you're going to be reading about lions, you're going to be reading about elephants that can't move out of those fragments, so therefore island or patch size becomes very critical. Again, some more figures. Uh, you already saw this one. Uh, this would be a patch of forest, another patch of forest. Now here's a corridor. We'll talk about those in a little bit, which is a management um, plan strategy to allow animals to move back and forth. I do not see a corridor between these two. Uh, maybe there is one. Um, this diagram, I mean, these patches are close together, therefore they might be able to move. Also, I'm, this is the first time I've introduced the idea of edge, uh, and sometimes edges can be very negative. Sometimes edges can be very, very positive. Um, we'll talk about both. Uh, and then again, the different types of habitat, especially in some of the areas where we're going to go and, and or in the tropics uh, where there's most fragmentation is going on. You can have a, a, a very diverse types of habitats. Some may be, uh, the matrix may be excellent for animals, other may not. So the primary influences um, there on the patch is the number of fragments, uh, the aggregation of habitat, the complexity of habitat shapes. This is in the, in the natural history of the species of concern. Now this is above and beyond island size and or patch size and distance to the mainland or larger habitats. So now in these diagrams, each one of these boxes, 20% of the area is black. So let's assume the black area is a forested area. So 20% of each one of these is black. Some of these you can figure out that, wow, that's, that's not probably not bad habitat as long as this really isn't hostile habitat. This one, maybe not as much, and that's because of the shape. Um, these may be too spread out. The distance may be affecting species negatively. Um, this may be excellent because it's a short distance in between all these different patches. However, maybe the species that you're concerned with the natural history of such and that it needs large patches. So this is the only habitat that it could be. So the shape, the size, how they're divided up, the distance in between is all going to decide effects. I'm back to that edge effect. Um, sometimes it's increased, positive and negative. Um, when it's considered negative, the smallest patches and those with more complex shape uh, experience the most negative effects. So here's a diagram kind of showing that. Uh, you still got a fairly large plot of habitat here, uh, whereas, and it, I think they took a 10% uh, edge. So the 10% of the area was affected uh, by the edge. And here you can see how much, if 10% of it of the area of the whole block of habitat is just considered edge. So less and less and less of the uh, habitat is, is preserved in such a, a way. The smaller habitats uh, could be more negatively affected by edge. 
Uh, some negative effects uh, include microclimate, uh, especially in areas like the tropics where light and humidity and ground and air temperature and wind speed all affect decomposition, nutrient cycling, uh, the type of vegetation that grows there. Um, you might get an increase in exotic, native, exotic species of plants. Um, fertilizer might get into the area. Um, you might have grazing from exotic animals. Um, and so a study that was done in Brazil and the Amazon found that soil moisture, vapor pressure, and the number of gaps influence vegetation changes 50 meters into the forest. Uh, and disturbance adapted butterflies and beetles and elevated tree mortality extended 200 meters into the forest. So trees, even though 50 meters, the, the microclimate changed, trees were affected up to 200 meters into it. Uh, Butterflies that are adapted to areas like an edge uh, moved up to 200 meters into it. Um, so it, it, it may not just be the edge itself that's being affected. Um, here you can see this is uh, Western Australia. Now, certainly the edges are being increased and there's a lot more increase uh, in 1984. But I think you guys are also smart enough to realize, now wait a minute, we've got a lot less and a lot smaller patches than we did pre-1920. Um, so all of this is affecting the native animals. Um, and unfortunately in this area, uh, because of the lack of vegetation now, um, the water table is rising, salts are coming to the surface, uh, which is killing agricultural crops and the native vegetation. Um, now, in North America, especially, um, and, and somewhat in Africa, uh, especially herbivores respond, large herbivores respond very positively to edge effects uh, many times. Um, in the UK, they, they might do a clearing like this to provide strips for a, a butterfly habitat. Um, but these edges can be excellent because all of a sudden you've got two different types of food uh, which helps the animal endure for a longer period of time over different climatic conditions. Um, so that, that actually, inducing edge is actually a key management strategy uh, for many wildlife species. Um, as I've already mentioned, but I wanted to show you that fragment size is often the most limiting. Uh, this is areas greater than 100 hectares. You always found the dormice. This is the area of islands and the number of reptile species. You can see the larger islands in the Caribbean had more reptile species as it got larger. Uh, Southwestern Sky Island mammals. Uh, this was done here in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, you can see the number of mammals increases as the island size, which is a island top surrounded by a sea of desert. Um, but it also uh, remember the effect of the distance to mainland. So even though you might have a large uh, patch, if it's too far away, if it's too isolated, uh, you still may have fewer and fewer species. I mentioned earlier the species natural history. Now here's a species, this is a Wilson's warbler, and, and they can move very easily. Um, and they can go in between patches. The matrix habitat doesn't need to be as good. But this particular species is migratory. Um, I took this picture of this bird in Alaska, and uh, it probably wintered in Central, if not Northern South America. It needed patches all the way along that flight. Um, and if those patches are gone, the species may be gone, or a number of spe the, the, the species may decline, which is happening to what they call neotropical birds, which are birds that nest in North America, uh, and then go to Central and South America to winter, it, a lot of them are declining because of patches that are disappearing, not necessarily in their nesting area or not even in their wintering area. It's patches along the route um, because the landscape is being modified. Predators, um, pollinators, parasites are often key. If they're missing, if the patch is too small um, for predators, uh, oftentimes, there's been some key studies that are done, found where the herbivore populations just overpopulated to such an extent that they destroyed the vegetation. Um, 
some species, again, um, this, this tawny owl, uh, this is in the UK, um, exists uh, in, in, in patches of 26 hectares. Uh, they exist in patches that were smaller than that, but they don't have as, their young uh, are not as successful in, in fledging. Um, species that require multiple habitat types are usually most affected uh, by fragmentation, such as that Wilson warbler. They, they need multiple habitats as they migrate. Amphibians, for example, that require one type of habitat for breeding uh, and another type of habitat for overwintering. If there's fragmentation in those areas, they, they might now have they might have plenty of breeding habitat, but too small wintering area. So um, it, it's a concern, and you have to look at all the different habitat types. Uh, the natural history of this species is such that in areas of Spain with less than 20% wooded cover, this is your Eurasian badger, um, their distribution was most affected by isolation. So if there was less than 20% woody cover uh, and it was an isolated area, there were not any Eurasian badgers. In areas when there was 20 to 50 percent woody cover, uh, they were most influenced by habitat quality, just as if there was 100 percent cover. So a lot of these species have some kind of threshold value. Uh, they need 20 to 30 to 40 percent, and if they've got that, then they're fine. If the matrix isn't too hostile, uh, they can be just as dense as if they were in an undisturbed habitat. Uh, some more examples, these are birds from Australia. Uh, the eastern yellow robin was most influenced by the amount of wooded cover. Um, the gray shrike thrush not only needed the wood cover, but it needed to be uh, in large blocks. It couldn't be in those small blocks like that uh, figure we showed earlier. And then the musk lorikeet um, needed a number of different vegetation types because of their diet. So uh, the natural history of any of these species is going to influence how many species live in an area. Um, our hu human processes associated with the development is going to affect different species differently. Roads, pesticides, hunting, plant removal, fruit harvest. Um, this different subsistence harvest in the Amazon really increased with road density. But you don't think, I mean, if they're building roads to get to a new area or to get to logging, oftentimes that increases predation by humans. It, predate, it can, can increase predation by other predators. Um, and, um, you know, there can be a lot of different effects by something that, wow, doesn't seem to be affecting the pack size that much, but if it allows new predators in, which the predators could be human or they could be a wolf, uh, a jaguar, whatever. Um, selective logging uh, in Uganda, um, which most of the time is, is not as negative. Um, however, in this particular national forest in Uganda, it did result in the reduction of a very cool looking monkey, a very rare one, the blue monkey. Um, but the black and white Colubus monkeys um, did better. Uh, they did better in secondary forest than they did over old growth. So sometimes when there's habitat is being used by humans, uh, there's winners and then there's losers. Isolation, um, you have to consider not only the distance, but presence of water, highways, extensive croplands, urban areas. In other words, can an animal, I mean, if you've got an animal that needs to move from one patch of habitat to another, if there's a interstate in between or a canal in between, they're not going to be able to move, even though it's a short distance. Um, some populations may be highly isolated. Others are just res not restricted in immigration. Um, and it's not a problem. Uh, the blue-breasted fairy wren in Australia, populations were declining uh, because of poor connectivity due to higher mortality during dispersal. Um, it, it, that, that necessarily was more isolated. Um, it just wasn't able to cross some of the matrix habitats. Um, some management has been very effective to, especially in the tropics, um, try and address that problem. Uh, leaving migration corridors, as I showed you earlier in a figure, um, or even areas of human use uh, with low human impacts, such as planting coffee trees. This is, we're going to discuss this in a little bit later, but this has been um, 
very successful um, called, uh, in, in coffee areas uh, in between tropical patches and allowing birds and some mammals and even some reptiles to move in between patches. Stochasticity. I don't know how many of you are aware of what stochasticity means. It, it's essentially random events that you don't expect. That's the easiest way for me to put it. Um, in my classes, I, I show people what stochasticity is by, I break the class into two groups and I give them both a quarter. Uh, and I leave the room and I tell one group to flip the quarter 50 times and write down whether they get heads, tails in order. The other group I tell them to make it up. And about 99% of the time, matter of fact I haven't failed yet, but I probably will, uh, I'm able to guess which group actually flipped the coin and which group actually made it up. Because the, the reality is if you flip the coin, you're going to get eight or eight heads or tails in a row. Uh, and the odds we are against that, but things happen um, that are rare uh, in the environment. And it could be demographic, which affects the survival and reproductive success. It could be environmental. It could be natural catastrophes such as flood fires and droughts. It even could be genetic. Um, and these unexpected, uh, somewhat rare, but events that will happen um, can affect populations much more so in a smaller patch or a fragmented environment than in a large population. You wouldn't expect anything. If, if one small part of a forest was affected by ge genetic stochasticity or a natural catastrophe, uh, it could easily be made up if the animals weren't isolated. Um, another term I expect you to know is metal populations. And this is where a series of smaller populations are, are interconnected by occasional movements between them. Uh, there's two different models. One end is a dysfunctional metal population where there's little or no movement, while the other is the movements are so frequent that it's essentially a single patchy population. So here are metal populations. Uh, and uh, here in Arizona, when I was involved in Bitcoin sheep management, um, we considered all of our mountain ranges to be meta populations of bighorn sheep uh, and we expected some movement if there was an interstate 10 or interstate 8 that cut through these areas then we tried to put in uh, ways for the sheep to move back and forth we've put up on highway 93 i actually recommended an overpass for sheep and they are presently using it um, and these are meta population models and there doesn't have to be an incredible amount of movement but just enough to maintain uh, to prevent inbreeding um, genetic health um, and it's, it's a very real uh, phenomenon in, in biology uh, meta populations because even uh, some patches aren't isolated because of human egg. They're just isolated because of, there's a sea of desert or a flat area or something. Um, and then within a meta population, then the quality of the patches um, it has to be considered, uh, has to be preserved as much as possible um, with some checker spot butterflies, um, populations in that were in heterogeneous fragments, meaning different habitat types were less likely to go extinct than those were in topographically uniform ones. Um, and the heterogeneity of the topography provided some areas of topo climates, meaning warm or cooler weather at, at time of the year that it needed um, over just a flat area. But if you haven't gotten the idea by now, small fragments equals low species richness. Um, and there's several, three key reasons, but several, there's a lower diversity of habitat to support smaller population size, therefore fewer species can maintain viable populations, and it represents a smaller sample of the original habitat, so by chance are likely to have fewer species uh, than a larger spe uh, sample. Um, size of distance, uh, habitat quality is very important. Uh, for example, in Tanzania, uh, forest understory bird species um, 
from 0.1 to 30 hectare in size was strongly related to fragment size, uh, but after 30 hectares, uh, it didn't seem to make any difference. Um, so there is, again, some kind of threshold value uh, that these species need to maintain population um, and, and number of species. Um, also, as we discussed earlier with the butterflies, we just mentioned briefly the heterogeneity, the differences within the habitat, even with, with differences in between habitats within a patch, or differences in topography within the same habitat. Um, here in, in southern Australia, uh, they looked at number of bird species, uh, and as long as there were greater than 10 hectares with greater than 10% tree cover. That's not a lot, is it? But as long as there was that 10% tree cover, the species numbers were pretty similar. Um, they, so they needed areas of about 10 hectares, 20 hectares in size with about 10% tree cover. This is really, coming from a management background like I do, being from Game and Fish for 25 years, this is really important information to have because then you can go into a meeting, you can go into an area and say, look, this is, this is what we, these animals have to have. So you can give a little bit, you can compromise, you can tell them, yeah, you can cut this much of the forest and, and you know that the species should be able to withstand that as long as you have you know, areas of this size and with this much. This is, this is really quality information to have from a research project. Predation can be affected. Uh, it can certainly be increased due to fragmentation. Uh, we mentioned earlier it's increased by roads, um, by humans. Uh, in Sweden, 45% of bird deaths were predated within 50 meters of a road, uh, but less than 10% greater than 200 meters, and that was directly correlated with the increase of corvids, which are crows, ravens. Uh, large predators, though, are often missing, as I mentioned. Uh, and there was a Turborg um, did a really well done study. It was on featured on National Geographic, where they looked at areas um, in Venezuela that have been flooded. They were islands uh, um, that were flooded during uh, when a dam was built, uh, and they looked at areas where howler monkeys no longer had jaguars and they became overpopulated. Their social structure completely broke down. Leafcutter ants were taking over islands and killing all the other species and finally themselves. Um, larger forest expanses where there still were the predators, uh, they, were, they seemed to be fine. And he called these areas without predators, which are keystone species, somewhat of an ecological meltdown. So fragmentation can be very negative. Um, predation can increase being uh, becoming too important or the lack of predators can be so important that the species destroy themselves. Um, and again, we've talked about natural history of the species. Um, in our country, the cowbirds have a more negative effect on birds nesting in small patches. Uh, cowbirds, if you don't know what they do, they're, they're nest predators. They actually go into a nest of a bird. Uh, they kick their eggs out. Um, say it's a wren nest. Uh, they'll wait till the wrens leave or they'll, or they'll drive them away. Uh, they'll kick the wren eggs out. They'll lay their eggs and then the wren will come back and actually incubate and raise the, the cowbirds. They don't seem to recognize the difference. Um, but uh, they have a very negative effect in small patches in the U.S. and Australia. Um, they don't have the problems with nest predation, but they're often competed by a, a more generally generalist bird um, and so if you're going to go to an area and become a conservation biologist a wildlife biologist you need to know uh, the natural history of the species in that area um, and which uh, are more likely to to be affected which are less likely to be affected which kinds of species are more likely to have a negative effect on others are predators going to be important to be present are predators uh, are there going to be too many predators uh, etc. There's no great um, uh, silver bullet that you can fix everything with. Uh, it's going to be a lot of different problems. Time lags are often uh, 
you may be working in an area and it's been fragmented and for 10 to 15 years you notice no problem oh everything's cool and then all of a sudden 50 years later half your species are gone this has been documented in, in quite a few areas with fragmentation so you can't just to, just because it doesn't look bad two to three years later uh, it may get very bad um, it's called also called species relaxation in Brazil it took fragments um, to lose they lost 50 percent of their species five years eight years um, eight years for 10 hectare fragments fragments 12 he years for 100 hectare fragments um, so it takes a while now what can we do um, to protect these areas uh, obviously by protecting or increasing the amount of fragment, fragmented areas, improving habitat quality, increasing conductivity, uh, managing disturbance processes, meaning fire, flooding, planning for the long term and learning from conservation actions undertaken. Um, the the no-brainer is prevent further destruction, uh, increase the size of ex existing fragments, um, increase the area specifically managed for conservation and give priority to larger fragments. This is debated and we can go back to our biodiversity lecture uh, whether large fragments are the only ones to protect or not. Um, you can control, try and control degrading processes like the invasion of exotic plants and animals, uh, manage the extent or impact of harvesting. Remember that one slide that we showed that okay some trees could be cut and as long as there was 10 percent woody cover the bird species would be all right um, you just need to make sure that threshold isn't crossed uh, maintain natural disturbance regimes we're going to go over the importance of fire and fire ecology and provide specific habitat features required by particular species um, whether the tree hollows rock crevices um, etc and manage uh, all the habitat, including the matrix, um, pest or plant animals, soil erosion, sources of pollution, nutrient addition, human recreational uh, pressure, um, address issues that affect the physical environment, um, ultra hydrological regimes, and the density of roads and other barriers. And in providing those connecting features, this is a huge um, effort right now is to provide some kind of connectivity. We'll talk about this in South Africa because again because of fencing it's very very difficult to do. You can't just let elephants out, lions out to roam. Uh, somebody will shoot them. Um, filling gaps or restoring missing connections, maintaining stepping stone habitats uh, especially for bird species, um, and retaining broad habitat links between conservation reserves. Um, and plan for the long term and most importantly learn from your conservation actions using current knowledge to forecast the likely consequence um, developing scenarios developing a long-term vision working with communities land use conservation goals integrating management and research uh, and monitoring the status of these species and ecological processes um, called adaptive management now we've got to put a buzzword on everything but it's essentially collecting data as things change um, and as you try to implement positive conservation actions you collect data if it doesn't work you publish that it's not highbrow science but it's certainly important for people that are making these decisions to know um, and you make changes and you document it um, and you you communicate with other people doing the same things so that is it for fragmentation. You do have a um, assignment that goes along with that, and um, that is due to me by July 13th. So I look forward to seeing it then. Bye-bye.